This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. It was May of 1809, and the bombs were falling on Vienna. Austria was at war with France for the fourth time in 18 years, and Napoleon's army had laid siege to the city. On the worst night of the assault, Beethoven sought refuge in the cellar of a friend's house, covering his head with pillows in the hope of protecting the remaining shreds of his hearing. Nothing but drums, cannons, human misery of every sort, he wrote to his publisher. How ironic that the music Beethoven would write in the midst of Napoleon's attack would come to be known as the Emperor Concerto. By the end of that summer, Beethoven had regained the ability to concentrate, and by the end of the year, he had completed three piano sonatas, a string quartet, and his fifth piano concerto. This might seem like a lot, but it was a lean year for him compared to the previous six, and he would never have another year as prolific as this one. It capped what has been called his heroic decade, which began in 1803 with his Eroica Symphony and culminated with his fifth piano concerto, both in the same heroic key of E-flat. Beethoven was one of history's most revolutionary composers, continually finding new paths in music by bucking conventions and trends. He especially enjoyed surprising his audiences by finding new ways to begin pieces. His first symphony begins on what would have been seen as the wrong note. His fourth piano concerto begins not with a bold orchestral statement of the primary theme, but with a contemplative passage for solo piano. His fifth piano concerto also begins in a way that would have shocked a 19th century audience, again not with any sort of thematic statement, but a series of virtuosic flourishes that would have sounded like cadenzas. Now, a cadenza is an extended, elaborated cadence, which, according to the Harvard Dictionary of Music, is a melodic or harmonic formula that occurs at the end of a composition, a section, or a phrase, conveying the impression of a momentary or permanent conclusion. Not exactly what you might expect to find at the beginning of a composition, Beethoven's bold statement begins with an ending. The Piano Concerto No. 5 opens with a call-and-response sequence in which the orchestra offers three grand chords and the piano responds to each with fountains and cascades of broken chords, trills, and scales. As flashy as this seems, it is the setup for the entire piece. No other concerto by Beethoven, no other classical concerto at all, in fact, is so full of figuration in the basic materials of piano virtuosity. Each of these three fountains highlights a different set of skills, a different set of tools from the pianist's toolbox. The climax of the third fountain briefly introduces the tension of a triplet rhythm cutting across the basic two by two. This is a primary feature of the concerto's opening movement. the simultaneous presentation of different rhythmic versions of the same idea. Beethoven builds this movement by increasing the dissonance, the cross rhythms themselves, and the actual harmonic dissonances that are produced by these collisions of two beats against three, three against four, four against five, and so on. After the fountains, the orchestra enters with what would have been a standard but lengthy exposition of the main themes. This long and majestic opening movement may be one reason Beethoven's English publisher, John Kramer, gave it its nickname, Emperor. Finally, the piano re-enters.
One of the other main features of this movement is how Beethoven blends brilliance with quiet, virtuosic with dolce, which literally means sweet. The entire first movement, which is the longest Beethoven ever wrote, is also one long virtuosic showcase, but marked by another of Beethoven's surprises, the absence of a long virtuoso cadenza in its usual place at the end of the movement. Remember, he had those three cadenzas at the beginning. The slow movement has been featured in numerous films, including The Competition, Art School Confidential, Fearless, and the James Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies. It may also be the inspiration for Somewhere, from Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story. It's centered on a chorale, which begins in the orchestra, and to which the piano's first response is a beautiful and expressive aria. Beethoven presents two variations on the chorale, the first given to the piano, the second to the orchestra, with the piano accompanying. Again, Beethoven defies convention. The accompaniment contains the melody, but rhythmically off by just a fraction. When the chorale dies down to the point of stillness, Beethoven makes one of his characteristically drastic but subtle shifts. Dropping the pitch slightly and gently introducing the outline of a new theme. Simply constructed like all the other themes in the concerto. Suddenly, that new idea bursts forth in its proper tempo and fortissimo. And the finale begins with a robust German dance. Beethoven works out the movement with his very own and very vast sense of space. Just before the end, another surprise. The timpani make an unexpectedly prominent entrance in a passage of equally unexpected quiet, setting the stage for a coda as brilliant as it is brief. Like much of Beethoven's work, the Emperor Concerto is an emphatic affirmation of hope written in desperate times. According to another legend, a French army officer stationed in Vienna attended the first performance of the work and was so moved by its grandeur that he cried out, C'est l'Empereur! It is the Emperor! With the music itself as the all-conquering monarch, that's a story that might have met with Beethoven's approval. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.